Uh, thanks for the kind introduction, Sanjay and um, Dinesh. So I think there is quite a lot of uh, knowledge already in terms of open wedge. And uh, I want to devote my 20 minutes to kind of underline why I still continue to use uh, a fixator. I started using a fixator uh, before before um, Domofix, which is a very reliable method of, of fixation was available. <laughs> Initially, Elizarov and then this unilateral uh, fixator, which I'll come to in a bit. And I want to sort of underline the reasons why I still find that the fixator is uh, very, very useful uh, in my hands. So here's a 66 year old uh, female who had pain since uh, three years, unable to walk, significant uh, virus. And this was her x-rays on uh, presentation. So bottom line, you know, age, amount of damage, really these are not uh, criteria for excluding patients from an HDO as long as the lateral cartilage is okay. So if you look at her uh, walk now, she has a significant lateral thrust every time she puts weight on the leg, the knee goes, you know, uh, externally. And uh, this kind of patient will benefit by a high tibial osteotomy. I point out the lateral thrust over here because oftentimes this is an indicator that there is a femoral uh, virus also. And just because this patient is 66 years old, uh, it's not necessary that they should go into a, a knee replacement. You could think about an open wedge or a closing wedge, uh, whether you want to do a fixator or a tomo fix. And uh, there is a little bit of controversy whether you should do the tibia or the tibia and the femur. In this particular situation, I think you should do the tibia as well as the femur. So I decide this based on uh, the MRI, which shows me whether the lateral cartilage is okay. Valgus stress view, which opens up. Uh, on the medial side and if the patient is an active person or otherwise a poor candidate for uh, a knee replacement, I will certainly go for a realignment kind of surgery. So that's her vulgar stress view, which shows that the medial side um, opens up. And this is the planning uh, that we've done. As I said, because her LDFA was um, abnormal, <laughs> 94 degrees, uh, therefore, if I have to correct all of that in the tibia with an opening wedge, it becomes whatever I need to correct in the tibia plus um, an additional probably looks like 7.5 mm uh, correction to compensate for the femur. So therefore, in this situation, I will do an LDFO, uh, uh, DFO, and that I prefer to do it closing wedge and the HTO I do uh, open wedge. So this is a standard uh, technique now of doing the DFO where you do a closing wedge uh, with a biplanar uh, component to that. You can see that vertical uh, component over there, which adds a lot of stability. And the same technique is also used with an open wedge uh, tomofix. But this adds a lot of uh, stability, prevents rotation. So this is at the end of correcting the femur. You can see that the alignment rod is still medial and therefore uh, that's the amount of correction that is needed in terms of an HTO. So we do a regular tomo fix in this particular case where intra-op the alignment rod is uh, around the base of the lateral tibial spine so that we are unloading the medial side uh, enough. And then if uh, we've done a femoral osteotomy, I use that opportunity to also add whatever uh, wedge was removed from the femur. I will add it in over there, which is not always uh, necessary. I'm sure Sanjay will talk about the uh, standard open wedge where you don't need a graft. Or sometimes when we do a debridement of the knee, we excise osteophytes. Um, those also can be added to this region. And that's her post-op uh, x-ray with the femur and tibia both osteotomized in one bow. However, when we do the full length post-op standing, I find that there is overcorrection. And this is partly because I will 
I will always exert myself to avoid under correction. I don't mind going a little um, over corrected, but I certainly want to avoid under correction. So on table, that was the alignment with all the things that are talked about in the technique, you give axial pressure, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But in these patients who've got a large JLC, a large opening on the lateral side, that turns out to be a little bit of a problem to judge what is the correct um, alignment. So we've got post-op um, over correction over here, which is not really a problem in the sense patient is doing absolutely fine. That's eight months post-op, everything healed off uh, well. That's what she looks like. A good uh, range of motion. And as you will see, her lateral thrust has gone. So patient is quite comfortable, in, but you know, uh, if you get excessive valgus, they are not happy with it from the looks point of view and, and the fact that the, the knee is kind of pointing um, inward. This is how we used to do the uh, closing wedge with a tomofix lateral distal femoral plate. I'm just pointing this out because otherwise there may be a little uh, confusion that patient was done earlier. Nowadays, what we do is we use a tomofix medial distal femur plate of the opposite side. This is a, a anatomic uh, implant. So if I'm, and actually it's meant for a medial closing wedge, but if I'm doing a, a lateral closing wedge of the right side, I will use a plate which is meant for the left and um, vice versa. And as you can see, this is a very, very low profile implant. So patients don't have trouble from point of view of uh, irritation from the thick lateral distal femoral plate. Now, here's another case. Similar, she didn't require, her, her femur was uh, okay. Again, vulgar stress shows that it opens out. That's the full length x-ray and that's the Miniachi way of, of calculating how to do it. Uh, older patients, I will do a tomofix. Uh, you must remember that the cautery cord is not the same as an alignment rod. And this is the amount of opening that we've done and the alignment that we get with axial pressure, etc., uh, aiming for the lateral tibial spine. So we did an open wedge tomofix uh, biplanar like Sanjay will describe to you later. But again, post-op, we have overcorrection. Patient is relieved of her osteoarthritic uh, pain, but she is not terribly happy with the uh, extra valgus which I have uh, given her. So this variability in correction with the tomofix, especially when you have a large JLC. So this is a picture of the uh, alignment when it is with, with a little bit of varus stress. And on the right, you see the picture which is with a little bit of valgus stress. You can see how much the alignment changes just by soft tissue uh, change. I've not done any osteotomy as yet. So therefore, I what I like to do many, most of, uh, many of the times is uh, to use an orthofix, which is a mon monolateral fixator. There are two pins um, proximally, which are shown in green. There are two pins distally, which is shown in uh, purple. There's a self-aligning or self-adjusting clamp, which is shown in um, red. And this whole thing is in a T configuration. The upper uh, two pins are kind of transverse and the lower two pins are uh, vertical. And in between the two, there is a device which will allow for distraction. <laughs> so we put on the fixator on the intact bone, two pins above, two pins uh, below. And in the extreme right picture, you can see the periosteum uh, through a small incision, which is running along the posterior aspect of the tibia. Once we have the fixator in place, um, the pins in place, the fixator is removed. And then I do a osteotomy, which is distal to the tuberosity. The tuberosity will come somewhere uh, at tuberosity will come somewhere over here, tuberosity and the attached uh, ligament. So I'm still aiming for the same point that Sanjay will be talking about later, where it is the tip of the fibula. But to me, the importance here is that the distal to tuberosity osteotomy, it does not affect the height of the patella, especially when you have to do a large uh, correction. 
also when you do large corrections a distal to tuberosity osteotomy does not uh, create any trouble with increased patellofemoral stress or in increased patellofemoral uh, pressure so though it is distal to the tuberosity it is still aiming for the tip of the fibula and this comes from uh, you know basic deformity correction principles very often when you draw the proximal axis and the distal axis where those two axis meet is somewhere around this line now uh, this point which is more or less in line with the tip of the fibula if you are doing a closing wedge also it comes Uh, more or less at this line and that's the reason why a coventry osteotomy in in everybody's hands uh, does well you know the the issue is with the accuracy in terms of maintaining the uh, correction and even here this osteotomy goes in this direction but the lateral hinge is still intact so this is uh, where the osteotomy will go and the difference between what sanjay is going to talk about and the way i do it <laughs> uh it, marked in red is the way i do the osteotomy and marked in blue is the way that uh, the aotomophics method is uh, described where you are going like this and then in the lateral there is this biplanar or vertical limb my osteotomy is entirely below the um, tuberosity and doing that i get an osteotomy which is complete enough that it can be moved like this but it is also incomplete in the sense that the hinge over here is uh, intact right so it's all opening around this intact portion of bone which is on the uh, at or around the tip of the fibula so when we do it with a fixator we are not correcting anything uh, on table we are just doing the osteotomy and patient comes out of surgery with the same amount of varus because we have closed it down you can see that you know very little of the osteotomy is visible and then after 7 days uh, utilizing the principles of elizarov of gradual distraction we start um, distracting till such time as you reach the appropriate uh, angle so here you can see from a uh, mpta medial proximal tibial angle of less than 90 this has come to a little above 90 and then more uh, valgus depending on on what is required so even when we do it with a fixator we do all this uh, planned correction so we find find out what is the angle of uh, correction and from there uh, we subtract the jlca that is seen on this x ray and we add three because that's the normal jlc there are two or three different methods of trying to compensate for this increased jlc this is the method that i use so if you see here the angle of correction is actually uh, 15.8 degrees and then from there i subtract 2.7 degrees which is this uh, jlca plus 3 and therefore i get the angle of correction in uh, sort of finally of 13 uh, degrees now <clears throat> the hka currently is um 170 so to that if i add 13 degrees i get into the right range of about 183 degrees so i'm taking this abnormal jlca into account and uh, based on that we plan uh, in with, with with the tomofix we say we transpose the angle of correction onto the uh, tibia at that point and then therefore you will come to know how much you need to open at this gap now same thing if you take it forward a little uh, this is how much distraction i will need on the fixator to get that appropriate angle of correction at this point so here um, with magnification corrected etc uh, that comes to a 21 mm which means 21 days of distraction because with the fixator we distract 1 mm uh, per day and of course uh, you you know that the further away you are um, from the place that is being corrected you need more distraction to get the same amount of angle meaning if my fixator was over here i would need even more days of um, distraction but after 21 days of distraction when the patient comes back and we do a full length x ray we find in this patient that the hk is not 183 uh, or 185 as we planned but is almost 190 
and the mechanical axis deviation is 65. It's way onto the uh, lateral side. Distraction over here at the gap is only about uh, 17 mm. <laughs> so we have a, a, a spreadsheet to sort of calculate so many days of distraction has resulted in so many days, uh, so much angle, and therefore how much we need to uh, reduce it. So based on that calculation for this patient, we needed five days of uh, reversal. That means five mm uh, going back to get our mechanical axis uh, deviation at 44 mm, which is based on the width of that particular tibia and a hip knee ankle angle of about 184. So this is 2 mm. This is not done over days. It is done um, right then. We do 2 mm, wait for a little while, um, and then again do it. So this is two days of compression. The HKA has now reduced to 187 uh, degrees. And this is four days. That means 4 mm of compression. It has now reduced to 185.5. Right Now, there, there are times when you get an HKA which is seems appropriate but the mechanical axis deviation seems a little excessive. And in, and in those times, I will tend to use the HKA as the correct uh, yardstick. So that's just the composite of those same x-rays which you saw. When she started, that was her HKA. When she distracted as, as per the plan, she was grossly overcorrected. We reduced it and again, uh, we reduced it so that we got our HKA to the appropriate angle. So her fixator was locked at 185 and therefore, and this is the uh, picture at the end of, uh, maybe after the fixator was removed, you can see all of that has healed because of the gradual distraction and the bone that is formed. But the important thing here is that the net distraction was only 17 days when as per the plan in terms of Miniachi, etc., uh, this was uh, 21 days or X amount of millimeters. So we really, in this particular situation, if we had only used the plate again, as per the planning, we would have um, landed up with over um, distraction. So in conclusion, for me, the fixator really allows a lot of post-operative um, fine tuning in the weight bearing position. And this to me is even more important. The younger the patient, the more important uh, this is to get that angle uh, just right. Because I don't want to, certainly don't want to make a mistake in under correction, but over correction also patients are not very uh, happy. And especially when there is a significant JLCA, that will tend to throw off your uh, calculations a fair bit. I do use the Tomofix in the remaining 20% of the cases, but these are usually uh, older patients or where the patients, in addition to the correction of varus valgus, they need a slope correction also because the Tomofix allows us to um, you know, take care of the slope. With the fixator, you cannot change uh, the slope. And in younger patients, where I'm doing it, for deformity and not for medial compartment uh, osteoarthritis. Because in younger patients, even if you are slightly a couple of degrees undercorrected, it doesn't really make a difference. They are coming to get the limb um, straight. Whereas in medial compartment osteoarthritis, I think going a little bit at least on the lateral side is significant, is important to reduce the chance of undercorrection and recurrence of pain after let us say seven, eight, 10 uh, years. So if you get the angle right, I think the literature shows that that has the maximum uh, long-term benefit. So that's why um, in many of, in, in, in large majority of my cases, I still prefer to use a fixator uh, for the tibial correction rather than a tomofix. Thank you.